Thank you. Uh, just let me check in with you for a moment. Um, hands up those of you who believe yourself to be inspiring. Hands up if you think you're inspiring. Okay, so that's a good, goodly number. Uh, so just let me point out to you, for those of you who haven't put your hands up, that the word inspire actually means to breathe into. That's Latin, I'll have you know. Latin, yeah? It means to breathe into. So can I ask you all to just check if you have a pulse? <laughs> So if you have a pulse, you are inspiring. The question is not, are you inspiring? The question is, what are you inspiring? Because you as a human being, you can't not inspire. And it was lovely to, to talk about identity, who am I? Because one of the, the, the challenges that comes for people like ourselves who stand up and speak at groups and come to a group that is challengingly named inspiring talks. <laughs> is the question, who am I to be inspiring? Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that gets in the way and has got in the way for me uh, over the years of my growth and my willingness to, to do things like this has been the, the challenge of taking myself too damn seriously. <laughs> don't know if you can relate to that. <laughs> so fear of failure is actually, I think, a symptom of taking yourself so, so damn seriously. Um, and I'm just really going to tell two, possibly if I've got time, three stories to illustrate that my biggest advances in my own development, my own growth, have actually come where I have been willing to be silly. Or have had no choice but to be silly. And incidentally, the word silly is a, um, it's an old German word and it actually means holy. Yeah, it means happy and blessed then it came to mean naive, and then it came to mean how we understand it now. And I would like to reclaim it. And I'm gonna do that through a couple of stories, uh, maybe three. So the first one is, um, when I was young, when I was a boy, um, I didn't have dyslexia, uh, because we couldn't afford it. <laughs> so I had what was available on the NHS at that time on the west coast of Scotland. And I had something called ESN, uh, otherwise known as educationally subnormal. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, so I had that label that who I am was educationally subnormal. Uh, and you know that as a kid, you know, you go to remedial, you, you find these things out. And I wasn't actually diagnosed till I was 30, but that's another story. <laughs> but school wasn't a pleasant experience. And, and amongst the unpleasant experiences were frequent parents being called into the school. And in one particular occasion, my father took me into school. I don't know why it was, it was him on this occasion. Um, but in Scotland, we love our dogs. It's become, beginning to become popular in Brighton, I notice. Um, and we take them everywhere. So we walked the, 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 the mile up the road and then the mile down the other road to get to school. I tied the dog to the school gates. My dad had the meeting with the school, and then we walked back up and then back down with the dog. And I don't know what had happened. I think he must have been shamed to such an extent that when we got into the house, he took the dog's collar off, still attached to the lead, and gave me a fairly lengthy and very violent beating with a studded collar uh, and uh, a chain lead, not, not, a, not a leather one. And, and the reason I tell that story is not about that story, it's about the ev ev evolution. Yeah, the evolution of that story. Because I, ladies and gentlemen, am a, an NLP master practitioner. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and during my training, um, I found myself telling that story quite a lot. Because in NLP, you learn that, that um, the two fundamental beliefs are that all actions have a positive intention, and people do the best they can with what they had. And intellectually, I understood that. And I would tell this story and I would say to people, and we're in the pub after one session. And I told this story, I think, one too many times. <laughs> and uh, some wag at that point said, did he take the dog off it? <laughs> now, I'm trained in emotional intelligence, so I just smile serenely. <laughs> but inside, I'm saying, you bastard. How dare you mess with my trauma? <laughs> it's my trauma and it's precious to me. How dare you? And it took me about three days to realize that he was absolutely right. 
and intellectually what I, what I did was I understood that what I had been doing was taking my trauma and polishing it and building it up and putting energy and time into building it up. In other words, I was colluding with it. And that understanding was really helpful in terms of that not being, not having no sting for me anymore. But not half as much as the mental image of being beaten with an Alsatian. <laughs> Um, and that's actually not a joke. That, when I talk about it, that's the, that's the image I have. But it has no sting for me now. Now, more recently, and again, this was not in my control at all, um, I'm, I'm in excess of 50, so, so I'm starting to fall apart. <laughs> and uh, a couple of years ago, I had, uh, well, I still have, in fact, um, some kind of, um, oh, I've forgotten the, the medical term for it, but basically a kind of urinary thing going on, <laughs> which is still undiagnosed, but it was like a really, really long infection. It was like having the flu for six months. And of course, you start then to have very unpleasant examinations, very personal examinations, very undignified examinations. And this is like six months in. And it culminated in, uh, I mean, it was bad enough. I had to go to Maidstone for the last <laughs> examination. <laughs> But it was basically the worst examination a man can get. So it was sticking a camera up a place a camera should never go. And it felt to me, actually, it wasn't just a camera, it was a whole BBC camera crew <laughs> with sound boom and catering. So I went home that night and I just felt absolutely miserable. I, to be honest, I was probably depressed. In fact, I was, I was depressed. And about a week later, after feeling really, really miserable, you know how you, you, you get a copy of the letter that's sent to the GP? So I got a copy of the letter that's sent to the GP, and it, it was, uh, the guy was Eastern European, but they use this code because they know you've got to see it as well. And it was, thank you for uh, referring this very pleasant gentleman, which meant I cooperated. Um, but the bit that really caught me was when it said, and I never thought I'd be pleased to hear these words, Mr. Cherry's external genitalia are unremarkable. <laughs> so, without any hesitation, I went straight on Facebook and lost a few friends by putting this on Facebook. And no word of a lie, I still don't have a diagnosis, the condition is still in existence. But I'd manage it so much better simply because I, it's not a big deal. It's part of aging, it's not a big deal. And I, I would trace it, it exactly to that moment of Mr. Cherry's external genitalia <laughs> are unremarkable. <laughs> yeah. Have I got time for another one? Yeah, go for it. So the, the last story is may, maybe a little bit more serious, but it's still about humour and it's still about silliness. <coughs> and it's about probably one of the most inspiring people uh, I've, I've ever met, who was one of my first clients. It was a lady called uh, Sue McLeod, who had, uh, she was actually a travel rep, um, but then she'd gone into further education and become a t teaching tourism. And when I worked with her, or, or when I latterly worked with her, she was the principal at Mid Kent College. Incredibly inspiring woman. Uh, and I got really, really bad news one day from a, a mutual friend who said that she had a brain tumour and it was really serious. And she said to me, uh, the friend said to me, you know Sue, she's very, she's very kind of self-assured and very um, caring and she wouldn't tell anybody the name of the condition because it, was, it would upset them or it, they would, they'd look it up and they'd start worrying. So I knew I was going to meet her the next week, so I thought, okay, I, I know that people don't want, I know what she's like, she doesn't want attention drawn to her, she doesn't want sympathy. So I wasn't trying to be inspiring, I wasn't trying to be anything other than normal, because I, I believe that what people want in that situation is just a bit of normality. And of course our normal in our relationship was I would generally be inappropriately facetious. <laughs> so I wrote to her and just said, look, I'm really looking forward to seeing you next week. Um, now, I know you, you, you don't want too much attention to do this and you're not naming the condition. So can I suggest a name for you? Can I suggest you call it Barry? <laughs> and um, it was just a joke. I wasn't intending to be inspiring, but I saw, uh, I saw Sue the next week. And Sue was, she was in a wheelchair. She was generally a very vigorous woman. She was, she, her speech was, was unclear. 
it was just you know a shadow of the woman she was in some ways, but in other ways she was still very much herself, already planning, um, doing work for other people in, in the, with the same condition. But she took me aside at one point and said, the Barry thing's been brilliant. <laughs> and what she said was, I've, I've actually, I have conversations with Barry all the time. In my good days, I, I can actually understand what Barry's positive intentions for me are, which that blew me away. And then very typically of shoes, she said, on the bad days, I get great pleasure from telling Barry to just fuck the fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the um, Sue died two days later. Um, and I wasn't able to go to the funeral. I was abroad at the time. Uh, but Barry came up in the stories. And Barry was with her till the very end. So to me, that humour allowed that, that silliness allowed Sue to be a, an incredible inspiration to her last breath, which I suspect was an expletive. 